this is the second part of lecture number nine, which was on wireless LANs and 802.11. In the first part of the lecture, I gave you an overview of uh, 802.11 uh, uh, infrastructure and how the backbone of the network works. And also, I gave you the MAC for all of them and the basic three uh, uh, physical layers, which were frequency hubbing and direct sequence and diffused infrared, all at the data rate of 1 and 2 megabit per second. In the continuation of this lecture, I will talk about 802.11b standard and 802.11a and g standards. 802.11b is using the so-called CCK, complementary code king technology, and it works uh, works on the 802.11 direct sequence spread spectrum chip rate. So you have the same chip rate as 802.11 direct sequence spread spectrum. This is backward compatible, but you get the chips, you code them differently. That difference in coding is called CCK. Okay, so basically you have the same in phase quadrant surface at 11 megabit per second, and you modify that to do. How do you modify that? What type of coding do you are using? You are using really MRE orthogonal coding. Do you remember where did we, where we used MRE orthogonal coding? In CDMA reverse channels. If you remember, we used MRE orthogonal coding. We had a set of orthogonal codes, which were like Walsh codes, and like you have eight bits, for example, and then you take like three bits to encode eight bits. Why did we do that? To improve the performance in the reverse channel in there. In here, we are doing that in only to increase the data rate. And we do it for the chip rates. Let's see how, how they have implemented that. Basically, the difference between the codes that we are using in here, in CCK, and the codes that they use in IS-95, is that in IS-95, I had Walsh codes. Remember? I had zeros and ones based on binary. In here, they have complex codes. Means that rather than zero and one, they have what? One, plus one, minus one, plus j, minus j. Which are really four phases. It's e to the j zero, e to the j pi over two, e to the j three pi over two, e to the uh, j pi, if you want to call. Okay? So if you want to think about modulation technique, the symbols that I had for Walsh code were binary symbols. In here, in CCK, the symbols that I have is what? Is quadro, four phase. That's the basic thing. Other than that is MRE orthogonal coding, and magically they go from two megabit per second on the same chip rate to what? To 11 megabit per second. Let's see how they do it. Walsh codes, you remember? This is how the Walsh codes are generated. You create one, and then one goes complement of the other one. And then you get this one. You put it in here, here, here. You complement it in there. That was Walsh code. And Walsh code creates what? A set of one, two, three, eight orthogonal what? A strings of bits. OK? Now, equivalent to that, rather than 1 and 0, you can put what? Plus minus 1, plus minus j. OK? Still, you can create orthogonal codes in there. OK? CCK is doing that one. The particular orthogonal code that they use as a generation function like this. This is the orthogonal code that they have. So how, do, how does it work? Let me just first come in here, and then I go to the next slide. Principle of CCK. How does CCK work? In the CCK, what is the data which comes in? Is 1 megabit per second. Huh? But what is the chip rate? Is 11 megabit per second. OK? In ADA to that 11B, what they do, the data which comes in is 11 megabit per second. First thing that they do, they take this 11 megabit per second data, and they form symbols which are 8-bit. 
means that every 8 bit is one symbol huh? now then the rate is going to be 11 divided by 8 1.375 mega symbol per second is that right? but each symbol is how many bits? is 8 bits now I have 8 bits and I want to use MRA or terminal coding okay how many possibilities I can convey with 8 bits uh, with 8 bits I can have 256 chips sets of codes okay so I can have 256 sets of codes each of these codes are how many how many because they are like in this particular thing each of them is like eight complex symbols so if I come in here I have one code in here which is eight complex symbols which is e to the j phi i for example one two three four eight of them okay and then I have <coughs> 256 of these codes 256 streams each stream is a complex 8 symbol ok so I have to address each of these lines these are 256 each of them is how much I address with how many bits with 8 bits I address it make sense and these codes are orthogonal means that if I multiply them together I add them up ends up to zero they are not on, they are not like Walsh code they are not 100% orthogonal there are some stuff which are not okay so I need like a mapping rule that I get these eight bits and I map it into one of these symbols one of the 256 symbols what they do is that they take the eight bits in here this is like 0 1 1 0 1 1 1 0 this is like 4 of them 4 of them they take every 2 bits in here every 2 bits they define what one phase with that huh? so I have like a signal constellation in here for example something like this this one is 0 0 this is 0 1 this is 1 0 this is 1 1 if it is one zero, one zero is pi. Okay, phi equals to pi. If it is one zero again, zero one. Sorry, zero one was pi over two. So this is pi over two. The second phase is what one zero, which is pi. Next one is one one. One one is in here is minus pi over two. The next one is what one zero, which is again one zero is pi. Do you follow me? So 8 bit comes. I divide the 8 bits in 4 2 bits. I associate one phase to every 2 bits. Okay? So at the beginning I have 4 phases. Phi 1, Phi 2, Phi 3, Phi 4, which are map of what? 8 bits. Follow? Do you get that? Then, I get these four bits, four phi's, I put it to a transfer function that a to the 11 has provided. And from this four phase, I get eight phases in here. Or eight symbols. Okay? So here is the operation. So, I have 8 bits I map them to 4 phase 5 1 5 2 5 3 5 4 4 phases 4 phase I take the 4 phase through a code CCK code I map it to what? 8 phases 5 1 Phi 2, Phi 3 up to Phi 8. Eight phases. Now, I have eight phase. Okay? 
this eight phase each of them is what it's quadrature phase it's one symbol for QPSK for each of them I send what one QPSK so I send eight QPSK sequence this is what they do do you follow me okay that's how it works now let's see how the number comes together the number should come together the QPSK signal which is transmitted in direct sequence spread of 802.11 what is the chip rate for that or symbol rate 11 mega symbol per second the data rate which is coming in is what 11 mega bit per second so let's see what will happen in between okay data comes at 11 megabit per second I know that at the output I have 26 megahertz of bandwidth which is 11 mega chip per second QPSK huh that's how it is so how does it work this is how it works the 11 megabit per second data comes in they group it at 8 so I have at the rate of 1.375 mega symbol per second its symbol 8 what 8 bit now I have 8 possibilities of complex ok how many total codes are, how many possibilities do I have each of the complex is 4 I have 8 of them I have 4 to the 8 I have a total of 65,536 possibilities from these possibilities I will run a computer program to find the 256 which are most orthogonal to one another ok so I have 256 orthogonal codes in there out of how many choices out of 65,000 codes ok but each of them are what 8 symbol each of them what a complex signal so now the data which comes out in here is what 8 coded complex signal and I'm transmitting that at 11 mega symbol per second okay and this is how, my, how, how I'm working this is how everything works okay so I, my output is at 8 mega symbol per second each of them at the rate of what at the rate of 11 mega symbol per second but every 8 of them represents one symbol now at the receiver when I receive the signal 25 megahertz at the chip rate of 11 mega symbol per second I take each HE8 of them and I form one symbol and I see what is the address of that symbol I decode that address in here or multiply it with this rate demox it I have 11 megabit per second now did you follow that? <clears throat> now if I had now if I didn't have CCK what I do I had this QPSK in here I have bits coming at 2 megabit per second directly coming in here is that right coming in there and directly coming in here decoded going up but when I decode there I have to auto make the autocorrelation function for Barker code so each 11 chip become one chip okay which I have like 2 megabit per second associated with them in here each 11 chips turns out to be what like 11 bits for me did you follow the concept so the data comes at 11 megabit per second forms 8 bit symbols each 8 bit symbol at the rate of 1.377 1.375 ok and then I take that and now for each sim I, I create an, a string for every 8 bit or for every symbol in here I create 8 QPSK symbol so again that 8 gets multiplied in here I have 11 mega symbol per second but this time each symbol is a complex number <coughs> then at the receiver I get each 8 receive signal I form one code <coughs> I find associated address and that's the bits 
I will send it out. This is CCK. It's a very difficult thing to think of. But when you think it like this, it's graspable. And if you're familiar with MRA orthogonal coding. OK? Now, in practice, really, this is the code. <clears throat> this is the function which maps. What are, <coughs> I have four phases, 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4. How do I find 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4? I had the eight bits. I divide them for four, two bits. I calculate four phases. I plug it in this equation. This equation gives me one input in here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight inputs. And this is the mapping criteria, which is provided by what? By 802.11b. So this is how I encode every bit to what? Eight symbols. Every eight bits to eight symbols. OK? Now, when they want to implement this thing, they play a trick, really. From the eight bits, if you like factor out, if you look at all of these guys, they all share 5 1. If you take the 5 1 out, factor it out. One of, two of the bits go out, the rest is 6 bits. And for 6 bit, you have an encoding which has 64 states, or 64 codes, rather than 256, which is easier for decoding. Okay? So this is how they do it. So, the data comes in 8 bits, <coughs> 2 bits get separated, 6 bits goes to 64 complex encoder rather than 256 complex encoder, and then the result at a rate of 1.375 megabit per second is encoded and sent out. So that's the story of what CCK. In another word, if you want to look at the CCK, the way that it is implemented in 802.11b, 11 megabit per second comes, 2 bit comes directly to differential modulation, QPSK, 6 bits comes, and this 6 bit address 64 possibilities for 8 coded complex data at 11 megachip per second. Okay? And they add together and they go out. The only trick that is played in here is that you make the complexity of the coding from selection of 256 to a selection of 64. Okay? By factoring out this e to the j5 in there, 5 1, which is common in all of them. Okay? So as a result, with every 6 bit, I choose one of the 64 possibilities, and the other possibility is 2 bits, which comes directly in there. Okay? So 2 bits goes directly, but this is equivalent to. 256 orthogonal codes. But implementation is easier. Why? Because at the receiver, I have to multiply, uh, compare every receiver with all the possibilities. Okay? 64 possibilities is four times less than 256. That's it. This is CCK code. In addition to that, now, if the data is like, like 2 megabit per second, normal data, it comes directly in here gets encoded, and at the receiver comes, and it gets, passes through Barker code, and get decoded at one or two megabit per second. If it is like CCK, it comes and goes through here. How do you know which of these two you have to go through? <coughs> PLCP will tell you. In PLCP, they tell you the data rate. So you read the data rate, if the data rate is with the front of the packet, you read, if the data rate is 11 megabit per second, you decode it allow according to the word, according to MRA orthogonal coding. If the thing is like 1 megabit per second, you do binary PSK. If it is 2 megabit, then you do QPSK. So that's the interpretation of the data which comes in the word in the header. And here we are. I can have different options which are both backward compatible. Why backward compatibility is important? Because already they had sold a bunch of direct sequence spread spectrum, access points, etc. They already exist. And you want to replace them with 811Bs. Okay? They must be backward compatible. Okay? But there is a transition time, which was less than a year or something, for the 802.11 to phase out. 
in the like if you go to cellular networks the phase out takes years actually still we have am system around what is the reason why wireless lands they phase out so fast but amps didn't phase out i mean 20 years they are around what is going on because infrastructure is more expensive and also they have popular use wireless lands they didn't and in addition to that these are local area networks managing and changing everything and also it's inexpensive I mean I changed the access point I have an access point which was like hundred dollar and a to dot 11 B comes or a to dot G I simply drop it out it's so inexpensive but my base station is a million dollar I cannot drop it as simple that's a very very important issue in here the way that we see now the technologies they are coming much faster to replace previous technologies because investment for infrastructure for local area networks is very very little okay so that's about it now going to 802.11a so do you have any questions on 802.11b so basically 802.11b has two options one is option of 5.5 megabit per second the other one is 11 megabit in 5 megabit per second they take 2 bits 2 bits 4 bits they encode it but it's a very similar infrastructure okay now so I have 802.11b which can operate at 11 megabit per second 5.5 2 and 1 2 and 1 are backward compatibility with the old one in addition to that the signal to noise ratio requirement for 5.5 and 11 is more so actually it's desirable to be backward compatible so as I go away from the access point I gradually reduce my data rate I have the same coverage as 802.11 original but when I'm close to like base station I have higher data rates sounds fantastic okay so 802.11a and 5 gigahertz band you remember that who was the first people who used 5 gigahertz band I told you a little bit earlier was Hyperland group what was the incentive for them they started in Europe and fairly soon in 1994 they secured like 350 megahertz of bandwidth see bandwidth is very important for wireless data for wireless lands but one thing that they missed was that bandwidth is not everything data rate is everything for wired local area networks if you can increase your data rates for local people in computer science are doing this thing computer networking people and they are thinking about like local area networks local area networks you increase the data, net, data rate that's everything but so they come to the wireless they say okay we go to 5 gigahertz we have wider bandwidth so that is the future and for 10 years people think like that okay but there's a flaw in there the flaw is that in wireless the issue of coverage is also important and you have very high data rates with 1 meter coverage nobody uses it so there's a balance between data rate and coverage which justifies the wireless local area network industry while local area network industry only data rate and actually a smaller coverage for local area networks was better because they started with like 2.5 kilometers for ethernet they ended up with 100 meter at the end okay so here is reverse okay because the meaning of coverage is different but took time took like as I said over a decade for people to understand that but anyways 5 gigahertz came like that to the market and in 1997 when 802 was completed immediately people jumped to 5 gigahertz to do 802.11a one good thing that they did is that they went for OFDM which is a more robust communication technique easier to be implemented and can provide higher data rates so with OFDM as we discussed in the 
third lecture you can go higher higher and higher data rates just increase the number of carriers but if you have one pulse after certain time multipath will be will not let you go to higher data rates OFTM is the most robust against multipath okay I had some curves that I showed you in the I think lecture number four or something like that which was comparing everything and was telling you that if you don't have any restriction on the bandwidth OFTM is the best modulation technique okay you can go to in terms of providing higher data rate. so with this way they started now we talked about OFTM before so now we just talk about specifications the way that it was used in A.11a and Hyperland 2 so basically what they have and also the same thing goes to A.11g as well okay but A.11g is in 2.4 rather than 5 gigahertz now they have basically 64 carriers okay among the 64 carriers, 48 of them is data. Four are pilot, 12 are virtual subcarriers. Sub, uh, sub Means that you can do different things with that. You can jump in those 48. For example, if some, one of these carriers in deep fade, I go to other carriers. I have a choice to design. Okay? And modulation techniques, this time, rather than PSK, they go from PSK up to 64 quam binary PSK is 1 bit per symbol 64 quam is 6 bit per symbol so there is a ratio of 6 in there for the data rate in addition to that the data which comes in first gets a scramble then it passes through a convolutional code the rate of this convolutional code can change and that will impact what the data rate so by changing the rate of convolutional code and the type of modulation per each of these carriers I can change my data rate and I go from 6 up to 54 megabit per second why do I want to make this wider and wider because it's better multi-rate is the solution for high speed wireless data when somebody is close give him high data rates signal to noise ratio is very high we saw that people used it in HDR they used it in like edge everywhere they want to use it but the first people who used it were wireless LAN people actually which they thought about multi-rate okay I'm close I will have a more complex okay so this is what it is now basically OFDM I take like 64 I have 48 channel I mean 64 channels are in there 48 of them are data okay so the data at whatever rate comes and gets encoded to a signal constellation okay and each signal constellation gives me a complex number those complex number 48 and then I have 12 plus another 4 64 then I take the FFT and digital to analog converter and I send the signal so basically the data comes in I let's say that I have binary PSK okay I have 48 channels so I get 48 bits and I map them to what to a binary PSK complex number so either they are 1 or minus 1 and they come they become one of these 48 and then I add another 12 which is optional plus 4 pilots and I take the 64 inverse FFT and I send it out okay if I have 64 quam what do I do if I have 64 quam its symbol is 6 bits so what I do I take this data which is coming in the data is coming in I form like every 6 bit I go to this 6 bit I go to a signal constellation like this uh, this is a very like it has 64 points in the constellation this is a very big one so I have 64 in the point in the constellation 6 bits addresses one of these points I take the X and Y of that point 
اوکی x and y i form a complex number r e to the j theta to, or to the phi whatever okay so this is one symbol next six bits another symbol and i create how many of this 48 of them r48 this is r1 r48 e to the j 548 so i've create 48 symbols okay what do i do with that I go to the FFT. Okay, I add twelve more. Uh, I mean, channels that are reserved, and I have four pilot. I add it to that. Here I am. Okay, so I take whatever number is, and that's how I change the data. Rate. Okay, so inverse FFT digital channel goes to the receiver. At the receiver, they do the reverse. They take the data in series. They make it what? Parallel. And then they do fast Fourier transform. Then they go to signal constellation. They get the bits up. And that's it. Okay? But implementation is very difficult. Synchronization is very challenging in OFTM. OFTM originally was used for voice band modems. Okay? But it was not successful. People didn't apply that. It lost to equalization. But in the radio channel, it won. And now it's a dominant, actually, source of for it. So every symbol, now every six symbol goes something like that. The complex number, you send it. This is that FFT. Then between two FFTs, you put like a, a time guard so that they don't mix. You send another symbol. Time guard, another symbol. This is how it works. OK? Now about the data rates. How do you calculate these data rates? Data rates, the transmitted each of these carriers that you have is like 250 symbol per second. Okay? That's each of all the carriers. Always there are so many symbols per second. Okay? Now you have 48 of them. You multiply it for 48, you have 12 megabit per, megas, megabit per second this is coded transmitted like let's say symbol rate symbol rate okay now but if I use for example a coding rate of convolutional code of one half means that Every two transmitter and binary PSK. Binary PSK is one bit per watt symbol. So my data rate is what? Data rate for binary PSK is what? Is 12 megabit per second. Because I had 12 mega symbol per second and I'm sending one bit per symbol. Now, out of in here I have a one half convolutional code means what means that every two bit in here is counted for one bit of data so the data rate is going to be what 12 times one half which is equal to six megabit per second did you follow that so you go as an exercise to this table and try other numbers okay you can find the same thing i have binary psk in here for example I have 12 mega symbol per second. Binary PSK, so it's 12 megabit per second. Times 3 fourth is what? 9 megabit per second. I come in here, QPSK. QPSK is two symbol, two bits per symbol. So my effective data rate is what? 12 times 2, which is 24 megabit per second times one half is 12 megabit per second okay I come to like 16 quam there is 12 times 4 48 megabit per second times 9 over 16 is 27 megabit per second and this is how I calculate different data rate. so there are two parameters one is convolutional code which was where convolutional code was in here when I was encoding thing the other one is modulation technique that I'm selecting 
for transmission. And this way, I cover data rates between 6 up to 55, 54 megabit per second. So this is my coding thing. This is 802.11a and Hyperlan 2. These are performance of this guys. For 6, for 12, 9, 18, these are the familiar bit error rate, or in here they have packet error rate versus signal to noise ratio. Okay, so if you want to get, for example, packet error rate of 1%, the difference between 6 megabit per second, this is around like, let's say, 12 dB, and for 12 is around 14 dB. There is like 2 dB difference between them. Okay, if I take now this one and this guy, it's like 4 dB difference, for example. This is another 3 dB. This is another like 2 dB. This is another like 3 dB. This is another like 5 dB. So the total difference is between 30 up to what? Up to like 12. So a range of 18 dB fluctuate, 18 dB. Now, 18, let's say rather than 18, 20 dB. In free space, 20 dB is what? One decade of distance. Okay, means that if you can cover 10 meter at 54 megabit per second in free space, with 6 megabit per second, you can cover 100 meter. Huh? One decade of distance. Okay, that's how you calculate this thing. Okay, but if this, if the distance power gradient is more than 2, it becomes less. But still, as you go, you have more. Follow that? This is how you relate the performance to coverage. Now, basically now the issue, these are some examples of what I told you already in there. I mean, I saw a similar example for you. I don't need that. So basically by going to like OFDM, I had like uh, several features in there. Number one was that I expanded the four level of data rate for 802.11, which was 11, 5.5, 2, and 1. I change it now with a number, like 6, 7 of them. I go from 54 up to 6. That's one thing that I did. Now, but the problem that I had, I was in the 5 gigahertz. So the next issue was that how I can jump back to what? To 2.4 to have a better coverage. To jump back for 2.4, they started to think about what? 802.11g. 802.11g basically takes the same technology, OFTM technology, which was developed for 5 gigahertz, and they applied it to 2.4. Okay? Now, in order to do that, now they had to, when you come to 2.4, you have to be backward compatible to what? 802.11. So they have to play some tricks. There is a transition period. It's a very short transition period. Because as I told you, in wireless lands, it's not like cellular. They don't stay forever. 802.11bs are now on, I would say, in a matter of like two to three years, they are gone. 802.11g is going to take place. If 802.11g shows that it is better. But as you can see, actually, in your project, 802.11g has more restricted coverage. So it has higher data rate in closer environments. So the problems, I mean, this transition may take a little longer than the transition from 802.11 to 802.11b. But it would be over a period of several years. OK. But anyways. After that, alone, before that, backward compatible. <coughs> now, what they did in 802.11g, they added some new features. They went to OFTM, which can go to 54 megabit per second. They used that request to sense clear to sense to coexist with what? 11b. You can use that. Okay? If you use request to send clear to send, you send the request to send. So that's one mechanism. I send request to send. Everybody goes to nav. I'm the only person. OK? Now I hold the channel. Nobody is there. I send OFTM. 
That's one solution. You follow me? That's this way. I don't need to have any header or nothing. Okay. The other one is that I want to coexist with CCK, so I have to use the same header as CCK. Okay. That's the other option. Okay. So this is OFTM solution for 802.11g. But when they went to 802.11g, there was another modulation technique compatible uh, uh, competitor, which was packet binary convolutional code. This type of coding is an extension of the CCK coding and can go up to 33 megabit per second. So the standardization activity should just justify everything. Just accommodate these two leading options, OFTM and PBCC, and come up with a standard for 802.11g. When it came to the practice, PBCC vanished out. Okay? But a standard addresses to that because they wanted to come up with some conclusion. Anytime you don't accommodate other people, you have a debate in front, so you come to the market later. Okay, so people try to accommodate. So 802.11g comes to these options, basically. They have OFTM, which is the one that everybody uses. They have CCK, and they have this PBCC, which is like a redundant case, really. Now, in the standard, they put CCK, see, I can have CCK header with OFTM signal. Okay, this is optional. I can have PBCC, it's optional. Mandatory is that I can use OFTM with request to send, clear to send, which works with the CCK, backward compatible. So mandatory battery compatible with 811B, mandatory OFTM solution. Optional CCK, OFTM, and PBCC. This is what 802.11g offers. If you want to compare 802.11b with the G, I dropped my microphone. If you want to compare B for G, uh, sorry, A with G. A is not backward compatible with the B, but G is. So if I have like some installation of 802.11b, for example, in WPI, I can buy a card which is G and operate in WPI. And when I go home, I put a new access point, which is 802.11g, and work with that. I couldn't do that with the A. With the A, I need infra new infrastructure. Number two is. A came late, two years after B. So B had already taken the market, 95% of the market. So B, A was late. Currently, this currently is actually a year before now. A had like 5% of the market. Now it's even less than that. Coverage based on data rate performance of G at 2.4% gigahertz is better than A at 5 gigahertz because of the coverage issue. 5 gigahertz bandwidths are not as harmonized as 2.4. Means if you go to different countries, they have different chunks of band assigned at 2.4 and 5.2 gigahertz. 5 gigahertz bandwidth or less commonly accepted. Okay? Means that in Japan, in Europe, and United States, they have more deviation. 2.4 is more harmonized. So these are reasons that G is preferred over A. Okay? So, like last year, we bought like uh, laptops. All of them, they had options for A and B. This year we buy, everybody have G. Because G is backwards, also compatible with the B. So, four packet formats they have. These are four possible packet formats. One is you have CCK with CCK header. You have OFTM with OFTM header. OFTM header is what? Shorter than CCK header. 
Okay. Then you have CCK header, OFDM, CCK, with people, which is not used that much for the implementation of four different options. Okay. So that's the story of 82.11G. Now, these are different data rates for CCK, OFDM 12, OFDM 18, PCP, OFDM 24, OFDM, variety of OFDM. Okay, so this is a comparison. If you get 802.11b and compare it with PBCC or OFDM, this is how they compare. But these are data rates after overhead. So you have 54 megabit per second, but the data rate is how much? Like 18 megabit per second, for example. Okay, this is after the overheads. Actually, in your project, you're doing calculations similar to this. Okay. Now, this is another one for, this one was for request to send, clear to send option of the MAC. This is for carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. For carrier sense multiple access, 54 goes up to like around 30 megabit per second. Okay? If you take the overhead away. The last thing that I would like to cover before we go out is Hyperland 2. Basically, Hyperland 2 was the European second phase of what Hyperland 1. At the beginning, they accepted the same physical layer as 802.11a. So they were there. But for the MAC, they insisted to go to time division multiplexing. So this is the MAC for what? For 802.11a. Uh, sorry, Hyperland 2. Basically, it's like time division multiple access with time division duplex. So you have uplink data in here, downlink data, and then you have some uh, physical channels in here. So this is one packet. BCH, FCH, these are for synchronization. This is for acknowledgment. This is for random access. This is the upload data, download data. So very similar to GSM. It's like a short form of GSM a short version of GSM. So they have a bunch of physical logical channels and a bunch of transport or physical channels. These channels, okay, and it operates. What is the advantage of this and who is after this one? The advantage of TDMA type of technique is that you can exercise quality of service better because there is no contention which is without control. In carrier sense multiple access, when packets, packets can collide and change the performance. In here, collision does not exist. So the environment is under control, so you can exercise quality of service. So who is interested in that? Companies whose main source of income is data or voice-oriented networks, which are the ones which are more keen on quality of service. Who is less sensitive to that? data industry, people who are internet users and make their income out of internet, they don't care about quality of service because already the industry is working. Okay? Now, in terms of performance, if you go to the TDMA type of network, like Hyperland 2, definitely overhead is less because the environment is controlled. Okay? So these are just comparisons of Throughput of 802.11a, this is for request to send, clear to send. This is for carrier sense multiple access. And this is for Hyperland. Hyperland has a much superior. I mean, you can go up to 40 megabit per second at 54 megabit per second line. If you go to carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, the maximum is what? Maximum is like 30. Now, as you increase, as you increase your data rate, so this is 54 megabit per second, huh? As you increase that to higher data rates, carrier sense multiple access becomes less attractive. So when we go for WPANs, for example, as we see next week, Hyperland 2 didn't go through. I mean, people are not manufacturing that. It was not a success. But time division multiple access, type of 
medium access is considered with 802.15 as the primary method. Why? Because in 802.15, you're thinking about data rates, this goes 110 megabit per second in short distance, up to 480 megabit per second, and even more than that. For those type of data rates, carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance is not good. You have to do a sort of what? Time division multiple access. Very similar to Hyperland 2, as we will see in the next lecture. But the, uh, the point which is very important is if carrier sense multiple access goes beyond data rates, it can be shown. Beyond like 70, 80 megabit per second is not effective anymore. You cannot cope with it anymore, anymore after that. And that's the incentive for going to TDMA. Okay? And incentive for going to TDMA in 802.15. Now, then another issue is issue of performance. Performance, next five minutes, maybe. Or maybe I keep the performance uh, for introduction in the next lecture. I think that's more fair. Because we are around the time that I promised 10 minutes more than time that I wanted to leave. So when we come back in the next lecture, I just start to talk about the performance. But really, the performance is not only for 802.11. Performance is for any local area network, whether it is 802.11 or 802.15. There are certain issues related to them, which is different from, as I told you, from wide area networks. And it's also different from local area networks which are wired. Okay. And those things I'm trying to cover in the next few slides, which would be the introduction in our last lecture, which is next week. Okay?